Revelation chapter 12, the woman, the child, and the red dragon. And we come to the point of our sermon, of our sermon series of Revelation. And although we've been embarking on the sermon series on end times, uh, for example, end times, death, to name a few, uh, it's been a while since we look back into the main book, the book of Revelation. At this midpoint of the book, I thought we might need a quick recap. First of all, our church team. The whole idea is to remember and return. Return to what? Return to our first love. Why? Because if we look at the times now, the times are near. We are living in the end times. There needs to be a passion for Christ and a compassion for God's people. And so we might need a re- quick recap as well from uh, Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11. Revelation chapter 1 to 3 is about Jesus' message to the seven churches. And we talk about Ephesus, uh, Ephesus, the church that lost his, uh, his first love, uh, Smyrna, the church of the suffering saints, uh, Pergamum, the church that was compromised, uh, Tyrotheria, the church that tolerated false teachings, Sardis, that sounds a little bit like Sardine for some reason, the church that was dead in their deeds, Philadelphia, the faithful church, and last of all, Laodicea, the church that was prideful and confident in material things. And then Revelation chapter 4 to 5 tells us, it was a little interlude that tells us about the Creator God who is worthy of worship. And He's the one, and the one who made it possible for us to worship the Creator God for all eternity is Jesus, the Redeemer Lamb, who was slain and worthy of all worship. Then Revelation chapter 6 to 7 tells us about the seven seals. The seven seals which increase seals, uh, as in seals, as in chop, not the ones that swim in the fish, uh, in, the, in the sea. Seals, the seven seals, the Antichrist, the great warfare, the famine, the plague, the, the martyrdom of believers of Jesus Christ, a devastating earthquake causing, well, the, word, the Bible says devastation, an astronomical upheaval. Then we reach Revelation chapter 8 to 11 when it talks about the temple where it talks about uh, after the seventh seal, it introduces the seven trumpets of judgments. And the trumpets include, the judgments include hail and fire that destroy much of the plant life in the world, the death of much of the world's sea life, uh, the darkening of the sun and moon, a plague of demonic locusts uh, that tortured the unsaved, and the demonic army that kills a third of humanity. Whew! And we've caught up all the way into chapter 11 up to, this, up to now. When we move forward, moving forward will be the, 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 the bowls that will be, not the twelve, the seven bowls that will be mentioned uh, in Revelation chapter 15 onwards. But right nestled in between chapter 12 to 14 is actually the central section of the book of Revelation. And 12 to 14 is important because it gives us imageries that becomes key to interpret other symbols throughout Revelation. Experts in history will tell you and literature will tell you that imagery has a way of telling stories, a way of explaining realities. And we call it, and all these reality explaining stories help people to understand not only the whys of life, but also the ways of life. Case in point will be National Day. If you watch National Day Parade, you see that there are a lot of images, a lot of imageries, you know, uh, interesting things. And all these things will evoke or provoke thoughts in your mind that is, yeah, this is how we used to be like. Just the other day, my wife and I went to the National Museum and we went to this section where it gives you different timelines, where you see exhibits of different timelines of Singapore. And so we reached the stage that is ours, uh, those that is between uh, 1980s, 1980s all the way to 2000, thereabouts. Um, and when we walked in, we, we saw posters of a show that, oh, we used to watch this show. Hey, this actor we haven't seen in a while. You know, and, and, this, and we saw things like, you know, the pay phone that we used, and, and we, used to t- we started talking about our life where, where it used to be, where you used to have pay phones, you don't have hand phones. So if you call somebody and you say, hey, uh, is, has uh, uncle has Ariel left home or not? Or she left home one hour ago. You have to continue waiting there until the person arrives because there's no other way that you can contact the person and you're scared that if you go away, the person come and cannot find you. Then we do things like, oh, I wait for you in the middle cabin, uh, uh, the middle cabin, the third door, uh, because there's no other way to contact the person via handphone. So all these imageries invoke not only memories, but a way of life and a why of life. 
So Revelation chapter 12 to 13 introduces three key antagonists, or well, like, like Deacon Joe was saying, well, it sounds like a movie, see, movie title. It's true. And it introduces three key antagonists in the drama of the last half of the tribulation. So we're talking about the last three and a half years of tribulation. First, Satan the dragon. Then next, we'll see the false Christ. And then after that, the false prophet. These three are, in a sense, an unholy trinity, right? as opposed to the true God, uh, the holy trinity, and his people on earth. And the first of these three unholy trinity, as I ordain them to be, we come to know of will be in Revelation chapter 12. And this is the red dragon. We see that God will, but we see that God will have his final say despite the presence of the red dragon in Revelation 12 because we are introduced to the protagonist, the woman from whom the child is born. Who is this woman? Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 to 2 says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun with the, and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. One key thing to remember is that the, the, apost the, apostle, uh, the not apostle, John, the author, he wrote and started off with these three words, a great sign. In fact, actually, there's two signs here later when we find out. One is a woman, uh, and the other is the red dragon. But before we go looking for a literal woman dressed in, you know, a dress in sun print, wearing shoes that has moon prints, and then have a literal crown of 12 stars, we need to understand what great sign means. So the idea of these two words, great sign, means that it's not to be taken literally, but to be understood symbolically. Okay? In, Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, it gives us the first clue. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts on the field. On the belly you shall go, and on dust, and thus you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put an enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So one of these great signs taken symbolically is this woman. And, Re and Genesis chapter 3 gives us that idea, that glimpse of this woman, who this woman to be. God has promised that the seed will ultimately, that, that the woman's seed, sorry, will ultimately cross the serpent. And it's actually an, a, a, a promise that we see echoed here again in Revelation chapter 12 and specifically in Revelation 12, 19, 9 and 17. Because of this woman that gave birth to a child that will crush the head of the serpent, a lot of people might think, oh, this woman is here talking about is Mary Magdalene because it's Mary Magdalene who gave birth to our Lord Jesus Christ. But interestingly, nowhere in Revelation teaches about explicitly about Mary and it's doubtful that Mary was persecuted after uh, Jesus, uh, after Christ's enthronement uh, and also needed protection for 1,260 days mentioned later in verse 6. Plus, there's just too many supernatural things, images around this woman to be Mary. Others, other people will say, oh, this woman mentioned here in Revelation 12 is talking about the church because considering that the church has to persevere through tribulation, persecution, much like the woman. But the church didn't give birth to the Messiah. It's the other way around. It's because of the Messiah that we, the church, exist so who is this woman that the Bible is talking about? One of the clues is the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars. Revelation 37 uh, verse 9 will give you the clue. What does these three things mean? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Right? Sounds like a Singapore flag, right? Uh, of course it's not. We need to account for the moon. Okay, uh, we need to account for the sun. There are two places in which the Bible uh, talks about where it features the sun, the moon, and 12 stars. And his interpretation is given. One of it is in Revelation chapter 12. The other is from Genesis 37 verse 9. And the word of God reads in Genesis 37 9. And then he, meaning Joseph, dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have a dream. I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars 
were bowing down to me. The twelfth being himself. Finally, uh, Jacob is the one who gave the interpretation in the next verse. He says, but when he told it to his father, he being Joseph, uh, and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? So wait a minute, Jacob actually knows what the sun, the moon and the stars were. His family, the signs represented Jacob himself, the sun represented, the sun represented Jacob himself, the moon, the wife, and Joseph, uh, which is, uh, and the wife, which is Joseph's mother, Rachel, and all the sons who will become eventually the 12 tribes of Israel. That means the woman is Israel. The sun, the moon, the 12 stars confirm this visual, this, this vision that the woman is Israel or its faithful remnants through the time of tribulation, the three and a half years. Fun fact, by the way, there are a lot of imageries that we can uh, understand. Those who fall away from our Lord Jesus Christ are often compared to a harlot. The, the church is compared to a pure bride. And the prophets portray righteous uh, Israel usually as the mother of the restored future remnant of Israel. In fact, the Bible says this. I think it's Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7 to 10, says about the woman. Before she, the woman, was in labor and she gave birth, before her pain came upon her, her she delivered a son. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Shall I not point the, cause, the point of birth and not cause it to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I who cause to bring forth shut the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem. Be glad for her, all you who loved her. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her. So in Jewish tradition, Zion or Jerusalem often appears as a mother. And so it references back, references forward for us in Revelation 12, the woman being Israel. Micah chapter 4, verse 9 to 10 reads this. Now why do you cry out loud? Is there no king in you? Has your counsellor perished that the pain sees you like a woman in labour? Weep and groan, O daughter of Zion. Like a woman in labour, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go out to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hands of your enemies. So now we can safely say that the woman is Israel. By the way, there's a typo in your uh, bulletin and on the slides. It's an error that I made. Not the fault of the people who are preparing the slides. Uh, Isaiah 40 verse 31. The reference is for point number 7. B, okay, for those who are following. And if you are following, now that we know that the woman is who the woman is, let's see who she gave birth to. So we're going to jump a little bit forward to verse 5. Talk about the protagonist. The protagonist here, who is the child? The Bible tells us she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Oh, sounds familiar. Who is the one who caught, caught up? Who is the one who ascended? The first person that comes to your mind should be our Lord Jesus Christ. But then how do we explain that the woman is not married now that we are confirmed that this is the Messiah? Well, again, we do a little bit of detective work. Lah. We work out that if the woman is the nation of Israel, out comes from Israel, is the Messiah. In Romans 9.5, Paul wrote that Christ came in the flesh, which means natural lineage from Israel. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7, it prophesied of a child from the natural lineage of Israel who will be God's son and will be our Lord Jesus Christ. So a little bit of detective work gives us the idea of it. And what of the iron rod then? Psalm 2, 9 says, contains the prophecy of our Lord Jesus' rule. It says, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like the portal's vessel. So in Revelation chapter 2, verse 27, 
our Lord Jesus also makes it clear that he has the authority from God the Father to rule with a rod of iron. Can you see how these similar words, imagery just keep popping and popping and popping and all referring to who? The Messiah from whom God gave them authority to rule. Revelations, Revelations 19.15 makes it even clearer the identity of this child who will rule with an iron rod. Verse 15, Revelation 19.15 says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword which will strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the, wi- the winepress with the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his tie, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who's the King of Kings? Jesus. So the centerpiece of this whole of, of Revelation, the centerpiece of how Revelation looks at history. Remember, to us, this is the future. To God, this is God breaking into history and doing something amazing. That's what this apocalyptic writing is about. He breaks into history and the centerpiece is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can fill the role. He's the only one that the Bible says he is the only one who's worthy to open and break the seals. Interestingly, we, yes, we have this symbolized birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have his ascension. But then wait a minute, what about the in-between? What about the life and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing is mentioned here. It's almost as if God was giving the vision and says, look, this is the beginning. These are the spiritual challenges. But let me guarantee you, despite all these challenges, the victory is assured. The child did not die. Despite the fact that there was one that will come to devour him. That will come to wait and devour him. That's in verse 4. Since we are in verse 4, since we are talking about the one that will come and try to devour him, why not jump to that? It is the red dragon that we're talking about. Revelation chapter 3, chapter 12, verse 3 to 5 says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, the red drag, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down on a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that he, when she bore her child, he might devour it. Again, once again, the Bible says it is a sign, meaning let's not go looking around for a literal red dragon. Okay? It is a sign. It's symbolic of something and someone. And the word dragon is very interesting. It's actually uh, uh, translated from two words. It's an idea... It's a connotation of a serpent or a monster that inhabits the sea. Hmm, wait a minute. Sounds familiar. Where have we seen this serpent before? Oh, yes. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. It's in the Garden of Eden that we see the serpent. The same serpent we come to, as Christians, call Satan. The deceiver and the counterfeiter. By the time we reach verse 9, a name is given to this great dragon. Satan the devil, deceiver of the whole world. Wow, what a mouthful. In fact, Apostle John wrote that this serpent was an ancient serpent. He called it not just an ancient serpent, he called it that ancient ancient serpent. So it's almost as if he's, he's alluding and saying that, yes, that one, that one that was in the Garden of Eden, that one who was tied in, who was implicated in the fall of mankind. Yeah, yeah, that one, that ancient serpent. That ancient serpent is now the deceiver of the whole world. And every time you read the, well, the whole world in Revelation, it is, um, there's a heartbreaking moment to it. Because the, whole, the word whole world is found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, with the reference about the hour of testing that is about to come on the whole world. In Revelation 16, 14, it is where the demonic spirits go out into the whole world to gather the kings for war. It is almost as if at this point in chapter 12, it's talking about a spiritual warfare and a physical tribulation of epic proportions. Spiritual warfare, tribulation of epic proportions. And this center to it all, the one that's causing it all, is the devil. He is the one that we call the deceiver, the counterfeiter, the greatest lie that the devil ever put was convincing the world 
he doesn't exist. Why? If you don't talk about the devil, you don't need to talk about the fall. You don't need to talk about fall, you don't need to talk about sin. You don't need to talk about sin, there is no need to talk about a saviour and a redemption from sin and the love of God. You know what scares me sometimes? Is that sometimes even talking to Christians, we can run church and make church as if spiritual things don't exist anymore. That is scary. See how many times we run church without going through prayer. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty as well. Sometimes I just want to plan and ask God to bless it. And then we forget that there's a spiritual element to it. Pastor Edmund Chan says this, that we are supposed to be spiritual beings first, then physical beings, physical-oriented beings. But the fall, sin, has caused us to invert that. And Satan pounces on this and say, if I can convince you that I don't exist, sin don't exist, I can take your eyes away from the existence of God and all the uh, things that is of God. I will take your eyes away from what truly, truly matters. The real dragon is not only a deceiver, but he's a great counterfeiter too. Look at verse 3. He had seven heads and wore seven diadems. What is seven diadems? Not, not, not diapers, huh? diadems. Huh? Seven diadems. Is, diadem is like a crown a king wears. And it symbolizes authority. Different, it's different from the victor's crown that a woman wore. So the seven diadems corresponded to the seven heads. One diadem per head of the dragon. And I think all these things, it's like, it's like Satan wants to be like God. He wants to be, have the authority. And then he wants to be like, perfect like God. So the number seven. So the whole idea is to give a fake or a, a counterfeit idea of what complete authority and perfection that he is. But there's a little bit of distortion here. Ten horns don't really work well with seven heads. So either that ten horns is meant to distort his so-called perfection that he's trying to pull across, or there's something else to it. Remember, John says, John wrote that this is a sign symbolically. So what does ten horns represent? Well, to this, we had to go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 and verse 20. And in verse 20, uh, we read a description of the beast that was prophesied during the end times. Let me read to you an excerpt from verse 7. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with his feet. It was different from all the beasts before it, and he had ten horns. This is the beast that, we meant, that Daniel had a vision of. is mentioned about the end times. About Satan. The horns symbolizes power. In fact, the, 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 the dragon at verse 4 seems powerful. He is able to sweep down a third of the stars in heaven and cast them to earth. Now, in Jewish symbolism, uh, stars usually stars can represent uh, righteous people. Uh, like you know, you read about Abraham, you know, your descendants should be as numerous as the stars. So, yes, it can represent God's people. But to sweep them down means that these people have been deceived from their faith. So these are what we call as apostates. Right? Uh, or in Revelation, stars also symbolize angels, which is a frequent uh, image and application in Jewish literature. So Jewish people actually recognize that Satan's revolt long, long ago led to the fall of many angels. So it can be both. It can be either or. It can be both. I would take that it's both. The counterfeit looks attractive, drawing them with lies and deceitfulness and deception. Little wonder Paul wrote that the devil comes uh, to steal, kill, and destroy. John also sees a, a, a vision of the repulsiveness uh, 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 of the devil's evilness. He stood in front of the woman waiting for the, womb, for the child, the moment that he was born to devour the child. And throughout history, in Genesis 3.15, we read that God, that this drama has been unfolding. God has put an enmity between the serpent and the woman and the offspring will crush the head of the serpent. So Satan is doing everything he can 
against God and against the plans of God. In fact, we see it during Jesus' time. When Jesus was on, on earth, the devil struggled to stamp him out. First thing that he did, Herod. He tried to get Herod uh, to slaughter all the ba babies in Bethlehem. Next thing that Satan tried to do, Judas. The crucifixion. So Satan kept thinking that he has the victory. There's something about his colour as well, the red. Red means to take the peace from earth. If you read Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, you see that the red, the red horse, the idea of it is that on, there will be no peace on earth. There will be murder and killing. So the idea of red being, being the dragon, really he comes to have this murderous intent. Steal, to kill, and destroy. But there's something that's nestled between that tells us that he's a counterfeit. Because... Satan could only just sweep one-third of the stars. As powerful and as authoritative Satan wants to make himself look, he's actually very constrained and restrained. Constrained. In Revelation chapter 8, we read about the seven angels blowing the seven trumpets. You will see here that a third of the earth was blown or burned up, a third of the trees was burned up, a third of the seas became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea had died, a third of the ships had destroyed, a third of the waters become, a worm, become wormwood, a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of the light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining. Likewise, a third of the night. All this is done by the authority of God. It is God himself who do it. And Satan is part of that authority. Satan has to submit to the authority of God. So Satan could only manage a third because everything else was in God's, everything was in God's plans. He is the one that is truly authoritative and powerful. And God's plan is what? God is the plan and the plan is of redemption. The new and final exodus. Verse 6, and it reads, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she, has, she is nourished for 1,260 days. Whoa, 1,260 days. Three and a half years. There you have it. This is a number that we have been talking about over and over and over again. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, we talk about how we worked out uh, from 360 days uh, a year, how 1,260 days would be three and a half years. Now, if you need a refresher, you can refer to the sermon on uh, tribulation on, on our YouTube channel where we explain how we got the seven years of tribulation and how we came about uh, having three and a half years from Daniel chapter 9. But there's something here in this verse that is interesting. The woman fled into the wilderness. It is a small word, wilderness, blink and you miss it type of word. Because why? Why did she flee fled into the wilderness? Why not to another city? Why not to another place that's where she's safe? Because the idea of wilderness is an image that would, be, that would invoke in the minds of the Jews God's redemption from Egypt, from bondage and slavery. And that is the deliverance from slavery. Exodus was a time that in, in the history that God's people were delivered from slavery and finally into the promised land. So what has got to do with the woman and the child? Because out from the woman, out from Israel came the child who is the Messiah who will also deliver mankind from slavery of sin and death. So there's this idea of how the wilderness is the picture of, yes, it's a deliverance. It's a place where we remember about Exodus. It's a word. Like, for example, if I mention to some of you Homlin Complex, the first thing you think about is what? Cha Kui Tiao, right? There's one famous one there. So that idea of wilderness just evokes straight away Exodus. Not our brother Exodus. Huh? I'm talking about the actual Exodus, okay? And here we see that Satan continually wants people to be in bondage. He wants to thwart God's plans to get rid of the Messiah. And so he stood before the woman. He was, about to, he was waiting to devour uh, the child. And when Jesus was born, we see how he used Herod to try to destroy him. This is spiritual warfare. So the whole of chapter 12 reminds us that it is a spiritual warfare. Warfare. Satan is like the new Pharaoh pursuing Israel, God's people, the remnants into the in the wilderness. 
And God reminds His people, look, there is a deliverance. That He is a redemptive God. There's a deliverance of Israel and the church in the times of tribulation where Satan pursues. So in these times of tribulation, there is a new and final exodus. And we know that it's final because when Jesus comes to judge again, it will be final. So we should perhaps why when John was recording all this vision, the vision shifts to a spiritual perspective occurring with events occurring at two places. When I say two places, it means there's the heaven and earth. Recently, I was having a conversation with my friend, a friend of mine, uh, one of my neighbours, and we were talking about uh, mission trips and how the spiritual things are real, you know, how we see people manifest, how we see people getting possessed, how we uh, pray for people and healing began, you know, uh, how we witness. Uh, in one of the mission trips, we had one of the girls that said that they, they thought they saw a drunk person break into their room, uh, pee at one corner and move off. And when we go there, we don't know whether it is spiritual or physical, but we know that it's a spiritual attack. So the spiritual warfare took place on different places. My friend was quiet for a while. And then he says, you know, in my mind, I know that spiritual warfare is real, but my fear is that I have become so logical in my approach to Christianity that I cease to believe that the things of spiritual are real. What he's saying is that we can do church even, be, even without being aware of spiritual matters. You see, we can become even how interested in scriptures unfold for knowledge's sake. I'm not saying that unfolding scripture is not important. Otherwise, I won't be preaching and doing so much work in the background for all, for all these words and scriptures. I think it's important. But we are not to be wowed or to, or to puff ourselves out and say, see, I got all this knowledge. The idea is to see God clearer. And the minute you see God clearer, you can't ignore the spiritual matters that God brings up in His words and in our lives. You can't miss that. Revelation 12, 7 to 10 talks about a spiritual warfare and that corresponds uh, in heaven, that corresponds with Jesus' triumph on earth. Spiritual warfare is real. That's the heavenly one. Verse 7 to 12, and he reads, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority is his. Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers have been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore, O heavens, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. It's interesting that Satan has two names. Uh, the first one is called the devil. So devil, the word devil is Greek in origin. It means slanderer, which means making a false spoken statement that damages the reputation or name of someone. Second, he's called Satan. In both Testaments, both older and the new, in Hebrew, in the origin, it means the accuser. That means making claims that someone has done something wrong. Years ago, I was praying for someone who was a medium and he was unwell. In the middle of praying and singing hymns, the person suddenly opened his eyes and then he turned to me and said, take your hands off me, you are filthy. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to open a way to heaven for this man. I see heaven. I see a man on the cross. I see a man on the cross. The person I was praying for had become possessed. And after much prayer, he calmed down. The spirit, presumably, the spirit has left. Uh, we don't, I don't know because he's a medium. And medium, you know, they dwell in things. You know that you have to continually pray for this person to cast out the demons. And after the spirit has left the body of the medium, the person come down, went back to sleep. He had no recollection of what he said to me at all. And I was alone at that time. And it's times like this, alone means that I was alone with one more other person. The person is not a believer. So in terms of ministry, I was doing this alone. And as times like this, I understood why we had to minister in pairs, why Jesus sent his disciples in pairs, you know. However, thanks be to God that my mentor's words rang in my head. When the, 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 during such confrontation, the devil will always try to remind you of your past. You're filthy, you're filthy, you're filthy. He will try to slander. He will try to accuse you. 
But remember whose blood covered and cleansed you is Jesus Christ. Remind Satan of his future. Satan's future is that of a defeated foe. Scripture suggests that Satan has been defeated more than once. Uh, that's why he turned up in the Garden of Eden, already fallen, already an ancient evil serpent. And, Eze and Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 talks about, uh, give information about the devil's uh, prehistoric fall. And even in Luke, our Lord, Luke chapter 10, verse 18, our Lord Jesus talked about how he saw Satan fell like lightning, fall like lightning from heaven. So Satan's second defeat occurred during the days where Jesus was on earth. So it's truly a tale of two places. Because you talk about Satan in this spiritual warfare losing his place. Losing his place. But that's the interesting thing. As Satan lost his place and cast down from heaven in this spiritual warfare, here on earth, the people who are going through tribulation, they, in contrast, they gain a place of refuge. Especially when he's persecuted by Satan. We read in verse 6, God has prepared a place for Israel. Verse 14, uh, where, a place, where Israel will be given a place where to be nourished when pursued by Satan. So Satan lost a place in the heavenlies, but God's people gain a place of refuge here on earth. Talk about utter and totally defeat of the evil one. It's also a tale of two places. The loss of a life and the gain of eternal life. It isn't just a place that God's people gain. So when Satan was defeated, even though he tried to use Herod, even, tried to, even though he tried to use uh, Judas, uh, thinking that he has won when Jesus was crucified, but it was his, the plan of God to resurrect Christ and defeat sin and death. It is the loss of a life that helps us to have the gain of eternal life. It was at the cross that Satan was cast out of heaven, so to speak. It was by the cross that Jesus prepared a place for his followers. The loss of Jesus' life meant that we gain eternal life. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 tells us that Satan's accusations against the saints has been silenced. Because why? Jesus Christ's victory is absolute and sufficient to suffer, to silence all his accusations. In verse 11, it says, by the blood of the Lamb, He gave us that victory. The place on the cross gave us a place in God's house. So what happens then in the in-between period? When Satan is cast down on earth and we're waiting for the final judgment. What happens now then? The Bible talks about the earthly warfare from Revelation 12, 12 to 15. Continues the verse 12 and says, But woe to you, O sea, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman who has, was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she was to be nourished for a time, and times and half a time. The serpent poured out poured water like a river out from his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. So Satan's defeat in heaven is does not mean that on, uh, we don't suffer or at the end of suffering on earth. Satan continued to pursue and continued to persecute through the time of tribulation. This is why I spoke about it's like a new exodus, right? Reminds us of Pharaoh, Pharaoh who uh, refused to admit defeat, continued to pursue the people that God sent, what God was set out to liberate. And so in the same way, Satan continued to oppress Jesus' followers, pursue the woman, again, the Bible says, into the wilderness, into the desert. So again, the idea points back to Exodus, except that this is a new Exodus, and it will be the final one. You cannot imagine the irony here, because the Bible says that Satan has a short time, but the woman's time is for a time. How ironic that God will plan it in such a way to further tell us that there's not much Satan can do against God. This is the final and new exodus before the end. This is the period of the great tribulation. So you read about how in, how in the great tribulation uh, from chapter 12, verse 14 to 15, 
Uh, and we read about the mouth here. The mouth here in Revelation uh, symbolizes speech. And so added with the phrase, poured water like a river out from his mouth, is symbolic for slander. So Satan continues to pour his slander, his accusations in, uh, to the people of the world so that he caused the, God's people to be persecuted. The word flood here represents sufferings, uh, represents unjust oppression. So we can see here how God's people are persecuted, accused, and slander. And Satan begins with Israel, the woman. He creates a, you can see now in the world, there's, there's a move of anti-Semitism. Satan has always hated the Jews because they are God's chosen people and a vehicle through which salvation goes into the world. So Satan would like to destroy the nation, particularly as the time draws near for the return of the Messiah. So more and more we see such things occurring. You go to the internet and you see all these things, not only just anti-Semitism, but keyboard warriors taking arms against the people of God at large. However, whenever there is trials of water, pardon the pun, God will always bring His people through. There's another mouth on earth, the mouth that counters the mouth of the dragon. Revelation 12:16 says, But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. God will put people raise people to speak up. There will be people used by God to provide refuge or a safe place. Uh, I, was, I had to do a paper on Schrinder's lease uh, many, I think about a year and a half ago for BTS. And I read about the real historical account of Schrinder. Poland invaded, uh, Pol uh, Poland was invaded in the fall of 1939 and they stripped all the Jewish citizens of their property, forced them to go into ghettos, and then uh, the Secret Service will use them as a uh, uh, free labour, including factories like uh, Schindler's factory in uh, Krakow. So when Schindler first started out, Schindler first started out, he was a noble person. He just wanted to make use of uh, the opportunity to make money. He was afraid that he would get drafted as well into military, so he used that as a reason and excuse. But then Schindler started to care for the Jewish labourers, so much so that by the time we reach the end of the, the, the account, about a thousand Jews were not only provided for, but they, had, they were provided shelter and refuge. One of the survivors was interviewed and said this, he was sent by God to take care of us. There will be people whom God will open the mouth on earth and swallow the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. This is the period of tribulation. The remnant will be sheltered in the last half. We don't know where they will be sheltered, the Bible didn't say, nor do we need to know. But the lesson is clear. God cares for those whom He uses to accomplish His purposes on earth. Time has caught up with me. And I want to go into the conclusion. What are some of the things that we can learn and take back in application? First, spiritual warfare and deliverance are real. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly place. If there's anything else, Revelation chapter 12 tells us that there is a real, in a sense, personal devil because he is taking it personally and he's going to make it personal because he hates God and he will do everything he can to make war against God's people. However, God is the one that is in control. God is the one that has the final say. The thing that we need to be aware of in terms of spiritual battle is this. First, we need to be aware that spiritual battle exists. Earlier on, I said that most of us don't because we live in Singapore. Why do I go on mission trip? Because mission trip kind of allows me to gain back my sanity in that sense. I go on mission trip and I see the spiritual battles are very real. see the oppression everywhere I go. And so we need to be aware that spiritual battles are real. Are we coming together to pray as a church? Do we take the things that is, of sp that is spiritual things lightly? Are we gaining knowledge for knowledge's sake or have the knowledge opened our eyes to see that the spiritual things are real? Worst, most importantly, if we see the spiritual things are real, you cannot but see and have a heart and burden for the souls that will be lost to a Christless eternity. That is spiritual. 
That is what the whole Bible talks about, what God is doing, who He is redeeming. But on one extreme of not being aware of spiritual warfare, we need to be mindful of the other extreme when in spiritual warfare. You know, there are prayer meetings that I've been to, uh, not this church, of course. Uh, the, the entire meeting was spent addressing and rebuking the devil, but God was rarely, if hardly, even addressed at all. The Bible gives us very uh, plenty of precedent of expelling a demon, not the devil, a demon if it's present. Mark chapter 1, verse 25, 26, Acts 16, verse 8, talks about this. But there's not a single text in the Bible that talks about addressing the devil. Some people address the devil as if he's omnipresent during prayer. No, he's not. Only God is omnipresent. The texts that have often most, like, uh, most often been cited have been misapplied by well-believing believers. They refer to resisting the devil, not rebuking the devil. So again, we got to get our word of God right. We got to go back to the, word, to the living word as our foundation. Paul wrote Ephesians 6, 17, uh, and that the one offensive weapon that we have in our spiritual armor is provided through his word. That's the word of God. So we got to get our word right if we are engaging in spiritual warfare. Revelation chapter 12, 11 says, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. By the word of the testimony. When Paul wrote Ephesians, he was, he was writing, when Paul wrote Ephesians 6, 12, he was writing in context of the gospel. Revelation chapter 12 by the, when we overcome by the word of the testimony, it is about the gospel, the word of God. It is for the gospel we will face spiritual warfare. It is by the gospel that we will overcome. Next year, our emphasis is on prayers. But we don't have to wait for next year until we start praying and engaging in spiritual warfare. The next call of prayer, the next time we are called to pray, church, will we answer the call? Realizing the reality and the enormity or spiritual warfare. Be aware that spiritual warfare is real, but we've got to do it right, girdled by the Word of God. The one person that I pray through that has a breakthrough of any bondage, I pray to God. He is the one that will break every single bondage. Talking about bondage, we finish a book called Victorious, Victory Over Darkness. So my second point is a play of words, already victorious over darkness because of the one, because of the conqueror. He is, is a little tongue-in-cheek, already victorious over darkness. Isn't it true? Because Satan is a defeated one. He's just making his last grabs to, to deceive anyone that he could. It's like my cat. Ah. My cat, whenever I come, my cat will try and hide from me. And then when I try to pick, pick him up, right, he will struggle. Ah, but I'm so much bigger than him. He will struggle, struggle, struggle. He'll try to crawl. After a while, he realized that's it. Ah. Forget it. And he just gives up. Because why he knows he's defeated. But I don't understand why he keeps struggling when he knows that he cannot beat me. It's the same thing with the devil. The devil is doing, is doing his final struggle, but he is a defeated foe. There's one author that says, Satan promises the best, but pays, but pays with the worst. He promises honor, pays with disgrace. He promises pleasure, pays with pain. He promises profit, pays with loss. He promises life and pays with death. There is nothing that the devil can do, right? There is nothing he can do. The cross was the place that Satan thought he has won. It became the place that he was defeated. And they overcome him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb. The Bible tells us in verse 12 that his time is short. His time will run out when Jesus comes again. Isn't that hopeful for you in what you're struggling with? Invite the musicians to come forward even as we close. One Reese B says, Christ's shed blood gives us our perfect standing before God. But our witness to God's words and our willingness to lay down our lives for Christ defeats Satan as well. Satan is not equal to God. He is not omnipotent, omnipresent, or omniscient. His power is limited and his tactics must fail when God's people trust the power of the blood. Even as we end our service and before we sing the closing song, what we do today counts. 
So I have a few questions for us to reflect, to think about even as we leave this place. As a believer in Jesus Christ, whatever darkness that you are facing, pierce that darkness by remembering that what you do counts. Obeying God's words. So if God says you're free, you're free indeed. Don't continue to live in that bondage. Take this as an opportunity to renew your commitment to obedience. Ask God to show you one specific area in your life in which there's a victory over darkness. It's already been completed by Jesus on the cross. You just need to surrender to it. Recall, take this occasion to evaluate whether you're holding on to the teachings that Jesus has given by the blood of the Lamb, but, by the, but also by the word of our testimony, by God's very word. Preach the gospel to yourself. Ask God to show you how to cling on more tightly to Jesus and to bear witness to others that He is the ruler of the universe. As we end, verse 17 says, And the dragon becomes ferocious, furious, that the woman has went off with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commands of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. And he stood at the sand of the sea. How does the war, devil makes war with the rest of the woman's offspring, which includes us? So we come back next week to Revelation 13. We will see how we respond to that as a church to rise up in times of darkness. So let's rise and let's really sing this song, Overcome. And we, we are people who really have overcome because of our Lord Jesus Christ.